Now I need to lay a, a foundation here. Tonight the lesson is on shifting from service to experience and uh, experiencing authenticity. If you're in business, you might actually take some notes on this. This might actually be useful to you. There's a shift taking place. There's a fundamental change in the very fabric of our modern economy right now. And that's what I want to talk about just at the beginning of this because it will help you to understand where I'm going with this. Uh, if you want to do any further reading on this, the guy's name uh, that's done a lot of work in this area has got a book or two out, Joseph Pine, but a lot of people have done work in that area. The name's Joseph Pine, written a book, uh, Authenticity, What uh, Consumers Really Want. But there's a lot of work that's been done in this area. It's, been, it's affecting our area of uh, uh, education. It's affecting education. It's affecting everything. It's already happened. So what we're doing is we're observing what has happened. And most of us aren't aware of what's happened. So let me see if I can lay it out for you in as simple as I can. But it's basically a fundamental change in the very fabric of our modern economy. Uh, to understand it, let me give you a history lesson. You're all going to know what I'm saying, but it's important to get it through your mind again. First, we were agrarians. That means that the way our economy worked is our economy was based upon the ground. We either grew it on the ground, we planted it in the ground, we pulled it out of the ground. We were agrarians. We were farmers. We were raised that way, and the stuff that we got out of the ground or we grew on top of the ground were known as commodities. And that's what our economy was based upon, those commodities. Whether we bartered them or sold them, that's how not just us, but the entire world ran. And that was the case for thousands of years, if not the majority of the history of the world. But then there was a shift. And that shift was into, uh, we all became industrialists. We live in predominantly an industrialized society now, where what we do is we use our commodities, the things dug out of the ground or planted and grown in the ground, we take those, we use our commodities to make and manufacture what we call goods. So once we were on commodities, and now in the industrial society, we produce goods that are sold. And then there was another shift. So that's the, from the agrarian to the industrialist. And now we're all commoditizers. We move to commoditizers. Now commoditizers treat the goods as commodities. So we produce these goods and now we pr treat them like they were commodities. And people did not care who made them or where they were made. Once upon a time they did. They no longer did. Now all that mattered was how much did it cost. Okay? And that's when the goods were treated like commodities again. And that's the stuff that we produced or made or created or manufactured. Then we became Customizers, another shift took place where we customize. So that's commoditization, shift to customization. <clears throat> what that means is we started customizing goods. Uh, customizing a good, we automatic, when, when you customize a good that's been produced, when you customize a good, you automatically create another shift in your economy. That means you turned a good into a service, okay? So for a particular person, it has been now adjusted for that particular person. Even though it's still a good, it has now become a service. It wasn't inventoried because it was customized. So you customize it for that indiv individual. It was delivered on demand to that individual. And so the society for the large portion has shifted to custom customization. Then we shifted from an industrial economy in that shift. It was thought that we shifted to a service-based economy. I know it's a little complicated, but it's going to make sense in just a minute. Stay with me, okay? So we shifted from an industrial-based economy to a service-based economy. Now another shift is actually happening as a result of that. And that's the shift I'm on right now. That's where we're at right now. Uh, the shift is happening where services are now being commoditized. Do you, you understand? You turn them into a commodity. Long distance telephone services 
sold on price. We know that this has already happened. This isn't new. This has already happened. Fast food restaurants uh, with all their value pricing. Internet is uh, commoditizing uh, not just goods but services as well. So the shift that we're in right at this moment is not really that because that's already happened. The shift we're in right now is our level of economic value has arrived. We are going beyond the goods and the services. We have been a service-based society now for about 30 years. What's happening uh, when you cut, what happens when you customize a service? It goes back to the same idea as when you customize a good. It's the same thing. What happens when you customize a service? What happens when you design a service, which is our society now, when you design a service appropriate for a particular person and exactly what they needed at that exact moment, what happens in that society? The customer goes, wow. You get the wow factor. And it turns into a memorable event and it turns into an experience. So what I'm suggesting is, and this is what they're, the economists are saying now, is that we have and are shifting to an experience economy. We have been predominantly in a service-driven economy, and now it's shifting to an experience-driven economy, where experiences are becoming the predominant economic offering. And so that you'll understand this, let me couch it where you know it's true. This is not make-believe. This is not some pie in the sky. This is really happening right now. This is where you live in America today. I don't know about the rest of the world, but in America today, two really big examples of this would be Disney and Las Vegas. They are best examples of experience-based business models, and, but yet there are many, many more. Let me give you a few. There are now themed restaurants. Once upon a time, you go in a restaurant, it was just a wall over here or a window. Now there's junk all over the wall. You didn't just, you used to just sit in a chair. Now you sit in a, I don't know, like on a saddle, you know, and yell yee-haw and they throw you a rope of something. You know what I mean? It, it, it's, it's now become an experience. It's a themed restaurant. And uh, retail has become experiential retail. It's changing and has already changed and even more so and it's sp picking up speed. There are now boutique hotels specialized hotels that are now in the realm of being a boutique. Uh, a new thing that I didn't even know existed is apparently just exploded and it's moved all across the nation. It's called drying parlors. Now you ladies may know about this. Any of y'all know what, what I'm talking about? You don't go to get your hair fixed or permed or cut. You go there to have them blow dry your hair. And that's not maybe, that's all over. And the idea is that it fixes it up just a little bit, and somebody messes with your hair, ladies. Listen to me. One of the major things that women apparently like is somebody messing with their hair. Whether they fix it or they don't fix it, they like somebody messing around in it, okay? And so it's an experience-driven thing, and so they go out feeling like their hair looks like a million bucks because it's been blow-dried, and they love it. And uh, an example of that is 50 one guy has started 50 in like the last couple of three months. 50 of these places. They must be making some money. You don't do that for no reason, okay? But more than that, let me give you an example that might make more sense. Quite honestly, I cannot stand Starbucks coffee. But I love to go to Starbucks. And some of you are like that. If you want really good coffee, you go to McDonald's. They purify their water. That's why it's good. Most of, most of those places out there don't purify their water. They purify their water and they cook it to the right temperature. That's all you got to do on coffee. It's got clean water and you get it to the right temperature. Coffee tastes good. It don't matter who makes it, right? You got water that ain't been purified and you don't cook it to the right temperature. It tastes bad. I'm Gary. Said so. Starbucks have got lousy coffee, but they have got the coolest place and they got the the mocha whatever and the chili whatever you know. And it's just so cool, you know. And it, and they cost twenty five dollars a cup and everybody loves it. And they said, why are you paying twenty five dollars for a cup of coffee? Because it's cool, man. It's cool. So that's it. It's experience based. So in the, when when experience becomes the issue. Follow this now. When experience becomes the issue, not the thing, but it is what we're selling now as an experience, 
And that's the model. It's spreading across. When that happens, what matters? What is the sensibility? What is the criteria on judging that? What is driving our choices when it is an experience-driven model? What is it? And the answer is, according to this guy named Josh Pine I mentioned to you a while ago, is, is whether or not we're rendering authenticity. See, they want to see an authentic experience. Now, it might be a playful, authentic experience, but it's still a playful, authentic experience. If they visit, therefore, if you have a visitor come into a church, people raised in this society, what are they looking for? They're looking for not just an experience, that's right, but they're looking for an authentic experience. Now, that's what that means is... Uh, and then the question comes, how do you know when you see it, right? So if they visit, will they know this is an authentic experience? And it's not about, and listen to me now, this is the change that we need to think about because we don't think this way, because this has not been where we've been. We've been a service-driven society. So when people came in, we felt like we had to service them. That's not the way the new people are feeling. They'd almost rather you leave them alone. It's different. They're looking for an experience. So it's not about great attention to visitors and guests, but it's about an authentic experience. Will they have an authentic experience when they come here? Hmm. 1 Corinthians 14, 25, back to what was read a moment ago. The secrets of his heart are revealed, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you truly. He's truly among you. Will that be the experience that they have? My friend, that's the only experience that matters in an experience-based economy. Do they see God when they get here? Amen. You know, you didn't come. Folks don't go into a church building looking for pretty pews or beautiful walls or any of the things we think they come looking for. They don't care if the windows are stained or if there's windows or no windows. They don't look for that. They come looking for God in a church building. Amen. That's why they come here. So let me see if I can give you, as simply as I can, three things that will make sure that happens, okay? So if we're going to do this, we're going to shift, understand that everyone seeking authentic experience of a reaching touch, they want to be able to reach out and touch God when they get here. In Luke chapter 8, and, and not play like, but really do it. In Luke chapter 8, verses 42 through 44, now you all know this story about how that the, the, the head of the synagogue's uh, daughter's sick and is about to die and ends up dying and the Lord raised her from the dead. But in the middle of that, on the way to get there, this woman in the middle of this crowd, it says in verse 42 that the crowd, the multitude thronged him. Now how many is in a multitude? I don't know. But it's enough that you can't hardly move, I suppose. And everybody's reaching out and touching him. So everybody's touching everybody if you get squashed together. You've been in those situations. You've been, you've been on a subway or something like that. You know how it's just, or an elevator that's packed. Verse 43 says, Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years, which made her perpetually unclean, not really supposed to be going up to the synagogue, little less to the temple, who had spent all of her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by anyone, came, now listen to this, he, she came from behind, so she pushed her way through the crowd from behind. She came from behind, catching up to him, because he's on his way to Jairus' uh, daughter, right? And she reached down. So she didn't go up like that. She found down, and she reached down, and she found that blue thread. Now, if you know the Old Testament, you know how many knots were on that thread represented all the laws in the Old Testament, right? You know that. So he's looking for that blue thread on that tassel that hung off of his garment, and she touched that because that represented the law of God, the word of God to her. So when she touched the word of God's word of God, she was healed. In that moment, she was healed. I don't know about you, but I want to go to a church where I can reach out and touch him. Amen? Um, so let me suggest to you, 
Stop trying to sell this. This is not a commodity that can be sold. This is an experience. It can't even really be told. If what we have is worth having, you should be able to reach God when you get here. Amen? And they should know it. So a simple truth about experiencing authenticity is that everyone, not some of us, everyone is seeking an authentic experience in our world today and they want to be able to reach out and touch their Lord at church. The key to that, you got to do it every Sunday. You got to do it every Sunday night. You got to do it every Wednesday night because if you're doing it, they'll see you doing it and they'll want to do it. But you come here like a zombie looking out into space, don't be surprised with other people sitting next to you and zombie out too. You got to get your own self in gear. Amen. It's got nothing to do with the singing. It's got nothing to do with the prayers. It's got nothing to do with the preaching. It's got nothing to do with the leadership. And it's got nothing to do with the elders. It's got nothing to do with the teachers. It's got nothing to do with the Bible class teachers. It's got nothing to do with everything we tend to. Oh, it's how well the Lord suffered. It's got nothing to do with that. It's got everything to do with whether or not you came to touch God. And if you came to touch God, you know what? You'll touch Him. So you get yourself in gear and quit waiting on us. Amen? Amen? And people will see it. The other will help, but that is what does it. Amen. The other can only help. But you don't believe that because I can hear it and in your voice now you believe the singing's got to be great. The prayers have got to be awesome. Sermons got... No, it doesn't, my friend. Not for you to touch God. You can touch God sitting on a rock in the middle of nowhere. But if we all touch God together, we can make it. Amen? Amen. So, second little truth is that everyone's seeking an authentic experience of a healing touch. It says in verse 42, uh, let me 43, not a, now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years, it's a long time to be sick, who had spent all of her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, so she'd waste a lot of money on doctors. By the way, doctors can't heal everything. I wish they could. But medicine can't fix it all. Verse 44. She came from behind and touched the border of his garment, and it says, and immediately her flow of blood was stopped. And she knew it. That quick, she knew it. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to go to a church where I can be healed. I want to be healed. I, I, well, you, what do you mean, Brother Dutton? Well, however you want to define it, that's how I mean it. Well, you, you really mean heal physically. Amen. If that's what's wrong with me, that's what I want. Okay? I'm not talking about being healed from being fat or being 59. I can't be healed from being fat or being 59. But I can be repaired. Amen? Amen. I can be repaired. And I... I can even be improved by him. Amen. So that's what we need to come looking for a healing of my soul or looking for a healing of my spirit or looking for a healing of my body. But that's what I come looking for. And I don't, I'm not ashamed of that. I don't want to apologize to that. Somebody has a problem with that. I'm sorry. I'm here for that. You say, well, it sounds rather selfish. I just want to contact God because I got some needs. Anybody else out there got any needs? I got needs. So let me suggest then that we stop trying to sell this. This is not a, a can. You can't put this in a basket and say, here's the church. I can't put it in a brochure and say, there it is. This is something you got to be in. You got to experience it. And it, the only way you can experience it is if when you get there, the ones that are there are doing it. Then all of a sudden it's contagious. Then you catch it and you say, well, if I do what they're doing, maybe I'll get what they got. And that's what happens. So a simple truth about experiencing authenticity is that everyone, I believe everyone is seeking authentic experience. And the most important is probably at this point is the authentic experience of healing when they get to church. They want to go away feeling better than when they walked in the door. Number three, 
Everyone's seeking the authentic experience of a meeting touch. A meeting touch. Let me read beginning verse 45 and I'll try to explain what I'm looking at here. And, and Jesus said, who touched me? So not only did she know she was healed, he knew he just healed somebody. And the reason he didn't know who it was is behind him. Hadn't heard a name. Who touched me? When all denied it. Well, that means the woman was going, it wasn't me, wasn't me. Because <laughs> she's part of the all, right? It wasn't me. Because uh, she thought she was in trouble. I shouldn't have done that. I should have asked, I guess, permission, which is not true. When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng you and press you, and you say, who touched me? Can you explain that one to me? And, now he didn't do that, can you explain that thing to me? That was me, but... Verse 46, but Jesus said, somebody touched me, for I perceive power going out from me. Isn't that something? God knows. So he wasn't mistaken. He wasn't kind of thinking this was true. He knew it was true. Verse 47, now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, you can't hide from God. Amen. You can't hide your need from him. And when she saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling. She thinks she's in trouble. She came trembling and falling down before him. She's on her knees, maybe on her face. And she's like, uh, and she declared to him the presence of all the people, the reason she touched him. Lord, Lord, I've been sick for 12 years and nobody could help me. And she said all that and then how she was healed immediately. But when I touched the hem of your garment, I knew at that moment I was well. And he said to her, daughter, be of good cheer. I'm not mad at you. <laughs> be of good cheer. I just want everybody to know what happened. We just want to celebrate with you. Be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. What was her faith in? She had faith in the master, but she had faith in the Old Testament. She had faith in the law that was represented in the hem of his garment. She had faith that God actually means good for his people and not bad. That he actually wants you to get well. But more than that, she had faith that she mattered to him. She believed that she actually mattered to the Lord. Amen? That not only did she matter, but that the Lord could meet her with not even working at it. Not even working at it. The Lord could heal me. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to go to a church where I can know that He acknowledges me. That He knows what my need is. And he meets, he turns to me. That I don't just come here and look at a blank wall, but in my spirit, I know he's turning to me. That I'm experiencing God in my little world, in my little head during that little service. I'm meeting with him. Don't you do that? Amen. Don't you meet with him? in your soul there. I want to go to church for that where I can know that He acknowledges me. And I think we got to stop trying to can that. You can't can that. You can't put that in a bottle and, and say, buy this. You can't buy that. Well, it's uh, here, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. I believe that 100%, folks. But that sounds so much like a can sometime to me. Does it to you? I feel like we try to make it so simple that it just doesn't sound like anything. But the truth is, is that when you really encounter God, you know God and you know He just, and there's nothing like it when you know God does this, turns and looks at you and you know it. It's nothing like that. So a simple truth about experiencing authenticity in this 
experience-driven world is that everyone is seeking the authentic experience of a meeting touch where it's eyeball to eyeball, if you will. And I'm not talking literal, but eyeball to eyeball with God. God. Not make-believe stuff, not pretend, but God. Everyone, I believe, is seeking that. Now, I heard somebody say something similar to this, and I kind of twisted a little bit. It said the secrets of success, the secret of success is authenticity. So once you can fake that, you've got it made. I'm afraid that's the way it feels when you can it. To, fo focus, on, to focus on visitors, and, and don't get me wrong, I, that doesn't mean that I don't think we should be friendly to visitors, please. I, I like it that we have people out there handing out the bulletin, amen, and saying hello and showing people where to go. But listen to me, to focus on visitors don't focus on visitors. You really want to focus on visitors. Focus on your encounter with the Lord. Amen. Having an authentic experience yourself, you will do far more for reaching souls if you come here intent on praying through. If you come here with the intent on speaking to God and not to the ceiling. If you come here with the intent of singing to God and having an inner personal relationship with God while you sit in your little world there, I think that will be enough to reach any visitor we might have. And if it can't, if it can't, then it's not God reaching them. It's marketing. And I think marketing's fine. But at some place, God's got to get involved in this thing. Amen? Um, when you go to Panda Express, next time you go to Panda Express, and I like Panda Express. If, you're, if you own a Panda Express, I'm not trying to diss it, okay? I'm sorry. It's just, okay. It's, but Panda Express is, I don't know if you know this, is planning to expand into China where they will find their menu a hard sell. Food we think of as Chinese is often absolutely unrecognizable to Chinese people. In fact, uh, Jennifer Lee from NPR was talking about what, what Panda Express is fixing to do. And she said the Chinese food we eat in America is very alien to Chinese people. And they're going to have a hard sell getting Panda Express to go over there. Because it won't seem authentic to them. It'll seem gimmicky to them. Gimmicks don't work. Reality works. I don't uh, know if, uh, and I'm not advocating this movie, but I want to read to you something because it speaks to this point. Uh, there's a movie called The Adjustment Bureau. It came out in 2011. It's kind of a romantic science fiction kind of weird movie. Uh, loosely based on a book by Philip uh, K. Dick. Uh, it's a short story called Adjustment Team, and the actor, as you can see, is Matt Damon and Emily Blunt. Matt Damon plays a guy named David Norris, who's a Brooklyn congressman running for the Senate of Brook uh, to be a senator of Brooklyn, I mean of New York, and he was winning until a college pitcher came out embarrassing where I think he's mooning folks or something. I don't know, something really bad. Makes him look really bad. So then he loses the race. And uh, while he's rehearsing his concession speech, because he was winning and now he loses, uh, David's in the bathroom rehearsing it, and he ends up meeting this girl named uh, Eliza, and they ended up kissing. Not crazy. You know, you girls, they probably love the movie. But uh, that's kind of it. Anyway, he's inspired by her, uh, to deliver a very candid speech, uh, making him, therefore, the favorite for 2010, the next election cycle, because of this speech. Nora's concession speech is this, and this is from the movie, and, and I love it because of the way it's just authentic, and I don't hear a lot of authenticity in politics anymore. 
and I just I thought this was really good. We had a rule in my neighborhood. When you got in a fight, it wasn't whether or not you got knocked down. It's what you did when you get back up. The crowd all cheers. I came here to tell you tonight that I will get back up. And the crowd cheers again, but David gets real quiet. Um, uh, we didn't have that saying in my neighborhood. It's just one of those phrases that, uh, uh, that had some attraction when a focus group and so we kept using it. That's not true. You know, 1998, I did a cover for GQ. The title was Youngest Congressman Ever, and since then, every story I tried to explain how I got here so fast, and the, the word that people kept uh, using was authentic. And the crowd cheers and claps. But here's the problem, he says. And he holds up his tie and he says, this isn't even my tie. This tie was selected for me by a group of specialists in the Tenafi, New Jersey, who chose it over 56 other ties we tested. In fact, our data suggests that I have to stick to either a tie that is red or a tie that is blue. A yellow tie made it look as if I was taking my situation lightly and might in fact pull my pants down at any moment. The crowd laughs. A silver tie meant that I had forgotten my roots. My shoes, you know, uh, shiny shoes we associate with a high-priced lawyer and banker. If you want to get a working man's vote, you need to scuff up your shoes uh, a little bit. But you can't scuff them up so much that you alienate the lawyers and the bankers because you need them to pay for the specialists back in Tenderfly, New Jersey. So what is the proper scuffing amount? Do you know we actually paid a consultant $7,300? He turns to his campaign aides and managers standing off the wings. He says, was it $7,300, Charlie, that we paid him? Charlie kind of whispers something to the other standing there. $7,300 for a consultant to tell us. And he takes off his shoes and holds it up and he says, and brings it up. And says, this is the perfect amount of scuffing to get your vote. And if you don't believe that kind of thing is done, you don't understand how little authenticity is out there. We must be the place where things are real. This has got to be for real. This cannot be pretend. We don't just buff up so that everybody will think we're awesome. And the only place to begin is that you make it real. You make it real. Not what's going on there, not who's preaching, not who's leading the prayer, not who's leading the singing. You make it real in your heart because you are contacting God. That's what makes it real. I think seeking authenticity is really, really hard. I, I, I twisted Jules Renard's statement and to say this. I am not as authentic as I should be even when I say I'm not as authentic as I should be. It's hard to be authentic. But we got to work at it, amen? Because we are living in a world now where it's not the flash and the bang. What they're wanting is the real thing. So now, if you want the real thing, it's up to you. Will it be the real thing the next time we meet together? Will you seek God? Will you seek Him the way you should? Will you seek to reach out and touch Him? Will you seek to be healed by Him? Will you seek to meet Him face to face? Because I believe visitors see that and they go, wow, that's what I want. And if you're willing to do that, then you could be the real thing tonight and come forward. See, we don't want anybody coming forward here to be baptized, to join a country club. We want you here because this is the real thing to you. If you come forward, you come forward believing with all your heart that Jesus Christ is the risen Lord and Savior. If you come forward, you come forward to truly put to death that old man and you come forward to confess Christ Jesus as your Lord. You come forward to bury that old man in that grave and to come up a new person with the Holy Spirit within you and really seeking God the rest of your life. You've got to be the authentic thing. Will you receive the authentic invitation and come if you need to while we stand?